Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, great to have everybody here. Uh, this is our uh, in the continuing series of Voices of Innovation. And uh, we have a very special guest this uh, afternoon, uh, Professor Vaklav Schmiel, uh, who is a uh, emeritus professor at the University of Manitoba. Uh, I hope uh, you've all read every single uh, book of his, because there will be an exam after the, uh, after the talk. And he will be doing the examination, not me. Uh, we, it's, a, it's a tremendous pleasure, Vaklav, to welcome you back uh, you. to Sarah Week. Uh, we have no idea where this conversation is going to go, so be ready Never. for that. Uh, but one, one rule I have, uh, we're going to go for about 30 minutes, and then we will have uh, questions and answers. If you have a question, please keep it brief, uh, 15 words or less. Otherwise, you won't get to answer, uh, ask your question, OK? So with that, um, I want to kind of get some basic stuff out of the way, Rock Club. Uh, do you st are you still working without a phone? Uh, yes, I still don't have a cell phone, but it's very difficult because people look at you like an idiot, you know? I mean, where is your cell phone? Already? It's very difficult because people expect that's part of your body now. You constantly hold it in your hand and constantly look at it, right? People never see the sky anymore. People never think about anybody. It's just about this, you know? I mean, it's ridiculous. It, it's reached totally ridiculous proportions. I think so. Yeah. So, actually, I did send you an email, and then I realized this morning that there is no use of sending an email uh, because no. you're not going to have the... When I travel, I just travel, right? I mean, you know, I enjoy the 75-minute taxi, right, from Houston Airport in traffic, right? Think of it, right? The city, you know, they do not... No city in North America, right, has a rapid transport from the airport. They live in 18th century, not even in 19th century, right? Uh, <laughs> we'll come back to, that, to yeah. that point in a minute. So, other question I have is that uh, last year you told us that uh, you have been uh, making a list of every book you read. Uh, so my question is, since last Sarah week to this Sarah week, almost a year, how many books did you read? Uh, it depends. Uh, I think I'm flagging a little bit. I used to do 100 a year. Now I do about 65 to 85, you know, so about 75 a year, I write, but uh, it used to be 100. So a book a, a, book a week, kind of, uh, or two yeah, weeks. Yeah, because week. I read too much other junk now, right? So that's the problem. Uh, and it's, it's best just to drop the uh, new junk. It's just simply, I'm rereading Melville's Moby Dick for about 77th time, really. If you want to read real stuff, read anything written before 1900. Uh, everything after, it's not worth it, really. It's fundamental. <laughs> it's not worth so it. all, all those Nobel Prize winners. You know, I used to, I, I read every, every line ever written by Hemingway, even these unfinished things. I tried to reread some Hemingway uh, last year. Mm. I couldn't go past page three, really. You know? So 1900 and less, you know. You know, Zola and Stendhal, you know, just, uh, but, uh, okay. And uh, the books you read, uh, anything you recommend to our audience? Yes, I recommend Steven Pinker's book that everything will get ever better forever. <laughs> I mean, I recommend that one, you know, that's, that's such an American book. Uh, that's what I call the, that's what I call the, uh, the selective inattention to facts, really, right? Of course things got better. That's the story of civilization. Of course children are not dying, you know, because we inoculate them. Of course, you know, but he leaves a lot of the things out, really, right? And that's the problem, you know. Actually, I, I shouldn't be speaking in, in any way in North America because I'm a skeptic. And... I'm an old-fashioned scientist, which means, you know, I question anything and everything you tell me, which I think is the duty of a scientist, right? But North America runs on beliefs now, right? Somebody says something, right? And it's automatically believed, really. Well, that's maybe that's a religious phase to believe, right? But scientists should question. But if you question in America today, ah, that's not very good. Uh, it's just, uh, it, it upsets people. It, it says, oh, you are so pessimistic. People think that reality is pessimistic. Well, I mean, a couple hours ago in this room, we heard how Denmark is a great example. Nothing against Denmark, but Denmark is less than Chicago. Denmark is, you know, one quarter of New Delhi. What Denmark can do, New Delhi cannot do so easily, right? Plus Denmark, okay, they have a high share of wind, close to 50% now, but it's great. Still, half of the time, there is no wind. So what? They get cheap hydro from Norway, or they get good old coal-fired electricity from Germany. What would Japan do in that case, if they would have a 50% really, right? There is no juice line to... Can they plug to North Korea across the Sea of Japan, really, right? So what Denmark can do, Japan could never do, really, right? Mm. Uh, plus, 
uh, I, I should mention that one. I write every month uh, this uh, uh, commentary or essay for uh, Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers for Spectrum. And a few months ago, I wrote this one. What I see when I see a wind turbine. And to me, wind turbine is a perfect embodiment of fossil fuels. First, you have to have these giant Komatsu uh, caterpillar machines, and they did a big hole. Then they pull us of concrete and reinforce steel, right, for the foundations, right? And then even bigger trucks bring these giant blades, right? Because you have to have a huge truck to bring it there, right? And then somebody has to smelt uh, iron ore and produce uh, big iron, make a steel out of it, a huge steel tower. And on top of that steel tower, they have to refine crude oil and make the plastics out of it and put it on top of it, really, right? Why? This is a total embodiment of fossil fuels. Without fossil fuels, that uh, could never be built. And people say, oh, it will return in terms of electric energy return on mm -hmm. investment, of course it will return. But it will return me electricity. It will not return me coke, which I need to build that uh, steel. It will not return me crude oil, which I need for that plastics. It will not return me diesel, which I need for those trucks to bring these giant things. We are, so we are long away from you know, becoming Denmark, so to speak. Okay, well, let's talk about a little bit more around the transition. Uh, but I want to start with this this point you have made again and again in your in your books. By the way, you have written now thirty nine, is that right? Or uh, forty two. Forty two. And when is the last next one? Uh, coming? Next one is in October. Uh, October. Uh, September. September. It will be just something like called growth, growth of everything from you know microbes to babies, empires to economies, uh, a growth of everything. Another depressing book because. Uh, Unlike, unlike uh, many good Americans who think that growth will go forever, forever. Actually, not only forever, not only exponential, but it will become hyperbolic. According to Ray Kurzweil, by 2047, so it will be growing so much that everything, our intelligence and everything, will be expanding at the speed of light into the universe. Okay, that's what Ray promised. The singularity. 2047, a hyperbolic growth at the speed of the light into the universe. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I mean, so this is a very depressing book. Shows that everything grows like that, basically, or like that, right? On a finite planet, there is a limit to everything. Extremely depressing book. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, you're still expecting people to buy it, is that right? Uh, or does it matter? People don't buy books these days. People just hear about books or, you know, kind of somebody mentioned, or people just simply check maybe like two pages on a pirated copy on the internet, but who the hell buy books really, right? You know, the, the age of book is over, has been over for some time, really. People buy books as they used to buy cookbooks, you know. Most people don't cook, really, but they buy cookbooks. It's a coffee table book. They just love these pictures. Really. So basically, all science books became a coffee table books now. Yeah? People buy them and just, you know. So you are, buy, you are writing books for yourself? Yes, exactly. That's oh. Every author, every skeptical scientist, you just simply cannot stand it. You can see these things like Ray Kurzweil says, you know, Expanding at the speed of light, right? So as an old-fashioned scientist, you say, well, is it really possible, really? And so you write a book about it, basically, right? So, uh, okay. yeah, basically. You well, uh, we still look forward to it. So, you know, it might be depressing, but I, at least I think the, your followers are looking forward to seeing that, so. I see, you know, the, 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 the question about books is, is kind of, I don't know where it stands, because I tell people always, people don't read books, but then people, oh, people read books, really. Well. Of course, we have all these surveys of everything. So the latest, I think it's a Pew, Pew people, Pew Research Foundation, uh, you know, average American reads one book a year. Okay, so I am vindicated, right? You know, I mean, one book a year, a nation of 325 million people, really. Japanese reads in some ways, but they read manga. If you know what I mean about Japanese manga, that's, you don't read. It's just one big picture, kill somebody, boom, bush, bush, right? Whatever. It's just, that, but they still read. They still read that stuff, yeah. So let's talk about energy system. And I want to quote from something I think you, you recently uh, wrote. Uh, in terms of the scale of the right, energy right. system, right? Global GDP, 100 billion. Trillion, uh, uh, trillion. Uh, uh, yeah, trillion. Uh, energy use around uh, 18 terawatts of energy. Um, 17 and a half, whatever, yeah. Yeah, close enough. Total amount of material we consume, 60 billion metric tons, roughly close. We eat 300 million metric tons of meat every year. 300, no, yeah. 300, yeah. So very big energy system, right? Uh, how do you change it? Can you change it? I think this goes to the very core of absolutely everything. Even before we talk about the system and how to change it, is it the fact to understand, I mean, 
nobody can internalize a trillion or a billion or even a million, right? Uh, it's just, you know, I challenge you this thing. You know, I used to with my students. We are very good at linear dim dimensions. That's no problem, right? Everybody can say 10 centimeters, bingo. I'm an average guy, I'm modular, this is 10 centimeters. Right? So everybody can see a meter, really, right? Mm -hmm. Please, this continent, please change to the Napoleonic system, change to a meter and kilogram, really. You are the only country on the planet which is living in, in this primitivity, it's unbelievable. Anyway, 10 centimeters, a meter, right? Areas, not so bad. One square meter, okay, people can imagine that. But volumes, right? I used to challenge my students saying, you know, how many these cartons of milk you can pour into a desk which would be this thick and would have a diameter of one meter, right? Mm -hmm. People get it wrong by an order of magnitude because already in three dimensions, we don't work very well, really. Right? Once you get over 1,000, 10,000. So you can read in articles in scientific journals which are triple vetted and, you know, checked and rechecked again, really, where people want to say billion, but they say million. And it gets through all these things, and especially with energy consumption. Uh, in scientific units, in US, it's still expressing something called quads, quadrillion of BTUs, or in BTUs in general. We left that behind in 18th century. So it should be joules, right? So it's gigajoules per year per capita. So in gigajoules per year per capita, this country is about 300 gigajoules per capita, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Europe is about 150, right? Most of the places in Africa are about 10 or 15 or something like yeah. that, right? But frequently you can say that people say instead of gigajoules per year per capita, people say megajoules, really, which is three orders of magnitude less. Yeah. I mean, people couldn't, people couldn't live on. Now, so this is the problem. Before we get to discussion, really, you know, what to do about these orders of magnitude, people don't even grasp them, really. And you can give a perfectly good lecture when you believe wrong by three orders of magnitude, and people will say, yes, yes, this is amazing, really, right? Mm -hmm. you know? um, but you see, in a way, it doesn't matter. Uh, does somebody know what is the U.S. debt right now? I find it amazing that people just don't know. What, what is the U.S. debt right now? How many trillion? 20 trillion. 22 trillion and counting, right? Like 22 trillion and counting. Few years ago, people were deathly worried about 15 trillion, right? So we basically made them from 15 to 22 in a matter of half a decade, really, right? I mean, so. Maybe these things don't matter. Maybe just they matter to somebody like me working with numbers. But who gives a damn another trillion? You know, we'll come another economic crisis, and what we will do? We'll just simply print. It's called quantitative easing. We'll print another three trillion and be done with it. Really. None of these. We live in a totally Alice in Wonderland world. You know, and trillions of things or monies do not matter. Really. Um, so coming back to energy. Yeah, coming back to the, you know, this is a. This is, a, this is a universe, you know, and in that universe, it's easy to do something than to do others. Um, so what is easy to do? What is easy to do is, for example, you mentioned meat, right? Yeah. I don't think, well, well, called, should we eat meat? Of course we should eat meat. There's absolutely nothing wrong about meat. We are, we are omnivorous species, you know. We grew up by eating meat. I mean, you know, we are not uh, cows and uh, we are not tigers. Uh, we are omnivores. Uh, but it's a question of, of, of scale, like, you know, how much. So this is a relatively easy thing, you know, that uh, for our health, uh, for children to get enough protein to develop good brains at mm -hmm. age four, they should drink milk, eat cheese, eat some uh, uh, lean meat, fine. But do we need to eat more than our body weight in meat every year, which typically Dutchman or Danish guy or American or Canadian is eating. No, we don't have to eat 100. That's about 100 kg per year? Yeah, 100, 100, well, no, 80, 90, 100, whatever. We don't have. All you, need, all you need to do is, is to eat maybe like 20, 25 kilograms. And even with that, you can eat meat every third day or every second day, cut up into small pieces in Indian food. Chinese food, really, right? Bulk of it is vegetables, rice, uh, noodles, little pieces of meat, really, right? And you get healthy protein intake. So meat is very easy to do. If we would go from, uh, it would go from this 100 to 20, 30, and if the Western world would give this example to the rest of the world, so the rest of the world wouldn't aspire to go from 20 to 100, really, yeah. right? Relatively easy to do. Uh, the uh, what would be the impact of that on the kind of energy and carbon balance if you did so that? The one thing which would be a perfect example where we miss the greatest opportunity would be buildings. Buildings are the longest lasting structures which waste energy on a grand scale, right? Most people don't appreciate that we have gone through the biggest building boom in human history since 1980, 
with Deng Xiaoping uh, economic reforms in China. Before that, Chinese were living in appalling conditions, and then they started build, 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 build. Basically, they built in half a year now what England built in a century, right? Until recently, practically all of these new buildings were without any proper insulation and single pane windows. Even in places in China where it's damn and cold, Very like cold. Uh, mm -hmm. Heilongjiang and Liaoning and Xilin and whatever. So if we would have taken that opportunity and built proper insulated walls and at least double windows instead of triple windows like I have, uh, we could have saved billions and billions tons of carbon for the next 50, 60 years, which is the lifetime of a building, 40 yeah. to 100 years, whatever. Greatest lost opportunity ever. And we are losing the same opportunity in hot countries because in hot countries, the difference, because the delta T is not so big, right? You want to have 20 inside and it's minus 40 outside, so you have delta T 60. But in South India, you want to have maybe like 25 inside and maybe 40 outside, but still there's delta T. So same goes for air conditioning. Yeah. In places which are hot, we should also be building super insulating buildings because of the demand for air conditioning. And we are not again. So we are committing that error, which will be with us for the next 50, 40, whatever, 80 years, certainly. And the cost is not that high? I cost mean. is not a cost, is, cost is, uh, Given the fact that it will be here for generations, Cost is depending what you do, five to fifteen percent, really, right? It's not it's not anything like fifty percent or double, really, right? And if you save on better proper design somewhere, cost is well, maybe five to ten percent really if you do everything right, really, right? No, cost is just just marginal, really, right? Uh, let, let's talk about uh, uh, energy density. You have written extensively about lack of understanding perhaps of energy density. Well, there are two things, right? energy density and, and power energy, density. Yeah. Right? There are two, two very different concepts. Right? Yeah. Energy density means that we will never fly with electricity. And I mean never, period, as simple as that. Never means as long as we will not have electric batteries which would be delivering electricity the same way kerosene can deliver to my jet Same engine, flux right? of energy, uh, right? So the flux, exactly. So that's what it is. So the, the, uh, the energy density of a, uh, uh, whatever is uh, Elon Musk, oh, by the way, uh, last year, remember, there was this collective intake of breath when I was speaking, I said Elon, Elon Musk is an extraordinary fraudster. There was this collective intake of breath in this room. Now you have this SEC confirmed that he <laughs> is a fraudster, right? People are like, oh, this is just thing. Uh, Anyway, so what, is, what Musk is putting into these uh, cars is about 260 watt hours per kilogram. Mm -hmm. So you may think about very good uh, lithium ion 300. We may actually push the lithium ion to 400, 450, 500. Keep that mind in, you know, 500 watt hours, right? Good old fashioned kerosene, 12,000, 12,000 versus 400 really, right? Right? So there you have it. Really. Yeah. So uh, we are talking here about three orders of magnitude, really, right? So uh, two and whatever. Um, so it's energy density. I just wrote for this uh, for this spectrum I, uh, this this month um, I, uh, an essay about um, container ships, because everything you wear was a container ship. Most of the stuff you buy in the store was a container ship from Asia, really, right? Um, if we would get the batteries even to 500 watt hours per kilogram. Typical container ship carrying 15 to 20,000 containers would have to carry 100,000 ton of those batteries. 100,000 ton of those batteries, right? I mean, that's a that's simple calculation. We see a little calculator takes you about 30 seconds if you know your numbers, right? You know, so uh, uh, that's not an easy thing to do. To eat less meat is easy thing to do. To decarbonize container ships on which everything now depends, all the global trade really, uh, Impossible, not going to happen. Right? Flying, not going to happen. Buildings, yes, but we are not even, you know, doing that. Um, then you have these things like, you know, uh, these two major companies in U.S., uh, Ford and GM, they said, we will not even make cars anymore. We will just make SUVs. This is not a misopportunity. This is a crime against humanity. I always tell people, explain me, please, why do you need a two-ton vehicle to carry a 50 or 70 kilogram person? Really? I mean, what is the reason there? And we brought it on ourselves. Mm -hmm. Until 1985, the animal called SUV wasn't known, really, right? Just, we brought it on ourselves, right? So that's a super, because if you count the SUVs, which everybody is copying now, Paris is full of SUVs, Tokyo is full of SUVs, right? If we would not have, 
unleash SUVs on the planet, we would have saved tens of billions of tons of carbon, right? So we always do something stupid, and then we can try to find a brilliant, technical, innovative solution. Why don't we keep, why don't we uh, stop doing these stupid things? Like, you know, why don't we build an insulated building? Why don't we run whatever, one ton car instead of two ton cars, right? I feel so forlorn. I stand on that crossroad on that red light, right? And I'm the only car there now around me, all these giant two, three ton machines, right? You know? Well, at least the progress is that you have stopped making a hammer, right? Mm. A military assault vehicle for personal use, at least they stopped making that, right? Chinese wanted to buy that. But the Communist Party in its wisdom said, no, you shouldn't buy it. The only wise decision of the Communist Party of China in past 20 years, I think, you know, to st not to buy a hammer, right? You know. So, so uh, since we're talking about cars, uh, let's talk a little bit about electric cars. And, uh, you know, uh, I think as uh, we talked last year, a lot of, uh, you probably will call it irrational exuberance on electric cars. So where are we? I mean, electric, and electric motor is actually more efficient, right? So what's wrong with that? Okay, let's let's say some, some preamble statement first. I love photovoltaic cells. I love electricity. I love electric cars. However, would I buy one? Of course I wouldn't really, right? Uh, we have just survived. We should have these t-shirts printed in Winnipeg. We have just survived the coldest winter in half a century in Winnipeg. In, 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 yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. For Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, some parts of the prairies, we had coldest winter in 80 years, actually, not just 40 or 50 years, right? Mm -hmm. And we had this weirdest situation that not only we had high pressure, every morning we had like 103 kilopascals, right? Normally it's 101.1, right? So yet it snowed. You know, so we have high pressure and it's low, and it's overcast. It's not basically every day, not heavily, but every day. So in the situation, listen to this carefully, our daily highs for two and a half months were below our overnight daily lows for two and a half months, really, right? We had for several days, we had a chill factor of minus 55 Celsius, right? For many days, we had a chill factor of minus 40, minus 45. Enough of the story. You know what will happen to your electric car when it's minus 45 chill factor, right? Okay? It will not even start really, right? Mm -hmm. Unless you have it in a heated cocoon garage, really, right? It will take about three times time, three times more time to charge it really. And as far as the mileage, to use the good American term instead of kilometrage, well, it will go about half or less than that really, right? So instead of doing 180 kilometers, you have to recharge it after 50 or 60. Because of the batteries, uh, efficiency so goes down. Everything in cold climate, everything electric dies or semi dies, really, right? So uh, if, you want, if you are in Santa Clara County in California, right, you know, that's fine really, right, you know? But uh, in tough places, uh, cold places, uh, and extremely hot places, the same thing really, it's not there. It's not there yet. Really. What about in China? Um, well, again, there is a large chunk of China, which is pretty cold, really, right? Mm -hmm. uh, even the capital can get pretty cold in winter. Um, the question is this. Uh, as I keep saying, I've said it so many times, I, I shouldn't say it anymore. There is no such thing as electric car. If I would buy electric car where I live in Manitoba, it's a 100% hydroelectric car. So it's no carbon car. If I buy an electric car in China, it's 70% coal car, because 70% of all electricity in China is coal. generated from coal. Mm. So how I am getting ahead here, right? When I dig lots of coal, burn it, transmit it long distance, lose my five, six, seven percent really, charge it, right? And I have an electric car really, do I or don't I really, right? Um, so Norway, Manitoba, Quebec, uh, British Columbia, but beyond and besides that, really, all of these cars are mixed cars, really, with a very high share. And globally, it's also like about two thirds right now is this fossil fuel. So what we are doing is just transferring the problem from one spot to another spot. Right? So we have a cleaner city, but we still have a big power plant. So in somewhere in Shanxi province, there's a giant one gigawatt power plant burning coal, right? And in Beijing, there's a clean electric car, right? But 500 kilometers west of it, a giant one gigawatt plant burning that coal. Really. So uh, it's, the, it's the consideration of the system, right? So if you were to decarbonize uh, power uh, or, or make it more renewable, then you think electric car will be a better solution? You see, the problem is what we have now is that, uh, like the previous speaker rightly mentioned, this like the giant flywheel, which is just gut rotating and very fast. And now, you know, I mean, how do you stop it? Because, and actually, it's even deeper than, I mean, there are 
there are many flywheels actually, and we don't know what would be the best opportunity or not opportunity, what is the best long-term strategy to start really? Should we pour it into buildings because they'll be long easier? Should we pour it into cars because they get used every day? But you know, they get used every day, but so little. 95% of the time they are just standing around there, right? Mm -hmm. So should we pour it rather into mass public transportation? which could be used like 90% of the time, as a car, which is not used 90% of the time. Should we start with uh, decarbonizing something which, uh, which in long run will affect more people than any of these things, which, don't forget, one billion people need heating, really, and need it very sorely. And about four billion people are demanding air conditioning on demand day and night because it's getting ever warmer, right? So, you know, I mean, where do we start with cars or air conditioning or, or we start with public transportation or whatever? So that's the problem. So we start sort of, you know, randomly. We, we do a little bit of this, a little bit of that. It's very uncoordinated. And uh, at the same time, let's say we achieve this partial success with something. But flying, flying is my favorite subject. I know a great deal about planes, I fly too much. Uh, but flying is one thing which is incredible. Uh, so China is getting electric cars. That's a perfect Chinese example, right? Mm -hmm. However, 10 years ago, you could hardly find a Chinese tourist in Rome or London or Paris. By 2022, 120 million Chinese tourists are expected in Europe. So they have electric cars, but they all use that kerosene flying, right? To Vancouver alone, there's like five or six Chinese airlines, right? Uh, I talked to a friend from Helsinki, and she said, on our flight from Helsinki, she's Finnish, from Helsinki to Paris, me and my daughter, we were the only Finnish people. The rest of them were Chinese, because there is a hub, direct flight from Beijing to Helsinki, whatever. So Chinese will have all these electric cars, but 120 million of them will fly every year to, to just to Europe. Forget about flying to Thailand or, or whatever, really. Near right? places. Eh? Okay, so you see, how do you attack this, this, it's, it's this it's beast, right? You know, it's this, so what do you do really, right? So I'm not very impressed, you know, by the fact that Chinese are pushing uh, officially lots of electric cars, right? But at the same time, they are telling our people, oh, enjoy your prosperity, go to Paris for a week really, right? I mean, this is about as energy intensive in terms of carbon as you can get flying hundreds of million people plus there and back for like basically a week or whatever, right? So uh, let, uh, you are kind of made the point that transportation system decarbonizing or, you know, it's very difficult because it's clearly. And all of it, you know, the flying is difficult, container ships are extremely difficult. Uh, the only thing which is not difficult, which we have mastered more than a century ago, is trains. We, we have mastered electric trains well, we, we've had electric trains since 1880s, pretty much, but we've mastered them now for generations, right? Uh, Shinkansen uh, celebrated the anniversary in 1964, right. really, right? you know, so, uh, I mean, however, who the hell wants an electric train in North America, right? Okay, nobody wants a, well, you know, Alexandria wants an electric train, but that's a different story, right? You know, AOC, yeah, uh, yeah, so she wants everything electric, but uh, uh, I will not say anything about Green New Deal because if I would say anything, it would dignify nonsense, and we should not, a scientist shouldn't dignify pure nonsense, really, right? But uh, electric trains are fine, but they will never take off in US. I just don't see it ever happening. See, in US, Why is that? Well, you see, we cannot, in the first place, let's be about clear, you know, that uh, in US and Canada, we cannot have electric trains as in Japan. Okay, or in China, because there is no population density really, for right. that, really, right? You know, so you cannot, during the peak hours, you go to Tokyo, Eki, to, to main station Tokyo, and there is a train leaving every three and a half or four minutes, really, right? You know, there is no such density between, you know, Winnipeg and Toronto. However, between Montreal and Toronto, between Boston and Washington, right? Yeah. Between Los Angeles and San Francisco, there is enough high density links in US to build them. But even these will never be built, really, because we invested so heavily into cars, really, right? So uh, uh, that genie is out of the bottle, you know. But, uh, we could do that, and Europe has been doing it, but the problem is this. They work very well from a technical point of view. They are rapid, they are reliable, they are very safe. Mm -hmm. However, all of them are running deficits. All of them. Because it, it, enough people are not traveling. In Especially country. when you send one after the other every three minutes, right? So all of them, huge mm -hmm. debts. So you dance around it, right? you transfer the debt to the state. or So, you know, so that's the problem is that I love them. You know, I'd, I'd rather go three hours in the train than on the plane, but um, expect. Not a, not a very optimistic outlook. Yeah. I want to move to power because 
decarbonization of power, at least in the U.S., switching from coal to gas has been a success. Absolutely. I think last year you said the gas people, and actually our previous speaker has a big portfolio of gas. They should be dancing in the streets. Of course. Uh, uh, what do you think today? Are we making, continuing to make Absolutely. progress? Absolutely, even, even more dancing in the streets. Absolutely. The, uh, uh, it was, you know, I mean, this has been in the cast. Many of these things are just given, like, you know, long-range forecasting is always tricky. But long-range forecasting of birth rates over the next 20 years, it's easy. Because all the mothers Around have been born already. You know? So mm -hmm. we just have to make the right guess about fertility rate. And this is not so difficult. If the past two generations had fertility rate 1.5, not even replacing themselves, we know that this next generation will not start having five babies, right? So that's it. So the same is energy transition, really. We've been transiting to natural gas forever, right? I mean, you know, you get everything cold and cold and whatever. So this is the right mixture. And the transition has been speeded up in US because of these old coal-fired power plants. Like a few years ago, we closed one. I, I checked these things. We closed one in Iowa, which was built in 1924. I mean, really, right? You know, so it had to happen sooner or later, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, natural gas is the fuel of today and future. and. Uh, tomorrow and after tomorrow, and, uh, and there is plenty of it, and uh, the whole planet is one gas ball, fundamentally. Tommy Gold was right about this, uh, probably few people know his name in this room, uh, uh, he died a long time ago, but uh, this, is, this, this is a ball which is dancing with gas, right? so we have plenty of it. Uh, uh, so I would, as a, as a first step, uh, I would just turn everything which could be turned into gas, would turn into gas. Right? So take coal out and put gas yeah, in yeah. as much as there you can. can right? yeah. But you see, then there are people who have lots of coal and they have no gas. Right? No. That's part of the challenge. In India, China. I hope this, well, it's not only India and China, that China built this capacity to build like, you know, at one point China was building every year more coal-fired power capacity than the total capacity built in France or England over the past 100 years about 50, 60 gigawatts a year, just every year. So they developed this huge capacity to that. And now back home they are slowing down, right? So what do they do now? They go worldwide. So it's not only in China. They have the, about 50 to 60 projects to build basically one gigawatt coal-fired power station by Chinese, with Chinese financing in places yeah, from Colombia, Colombia to Tanzania, you name it, really, as we speak, as we speak. Really. So it's not only China and India, right? That's the good point. But as far as China and India goes, um, uh, we talk when we had this, uh, Phone conversation a couple of weeks ago, we talked about this new Niti Ayok study, which says clearly in India, coal will be the dominant fuel at least until 2047, right? Because it was published already. And same in China. They made this forecast saying, you know, we will peak, our energy consumption will peak in late 20s. Then they said 2035. Then they say 2040. So these are people who went to, from 20 gigajoules to 90 gigajoules, but they still want to consume more at least until some. And what is their main fuel? Of course, it's cold, right? You know, so, but it's not only China and India. People should be reminded it's also Africa and Latin America. Right? Yeah. And it's Africa where we will add 2 billion people in next 50 to 80 years. And these people want to have everything in a hurry. And the greatest thing to get in a hurry is to build a big coal fire power plant, really, get that electricity, dug this coal, make that coke, and make that iron and steel because they have to build their roads and schools and houses, every infrastructure under the sun, which, mean, which means steel, which means coke for smelting iron ore. As simple as that. Tough, tough challenge. I, I am conscious of time, so okay. I, I actually have about 30 more questions, but I'm going to open it up uh, to the audience and see what the audience uh, want to ask you. So please raise your hand. Uh, there will be a microphone which will show up uh, to you. So right there. What are your thoughts on hydrogen? Uh, that's the best solution. However, uh, that's a very long road because you have to commit to the entire new system. You cannot do it incrementally. How do you do hydrogen incrementally? You can do, you know, photovoltaics incrementally. Right? I don't care if I switch on the light in my kitchen, you know, if it's coming from hydroelectricity or coal or, or photovoltaics, right? But, you know, hydrogen is a different thing. Storage, distribution, right? The whole system. Chicken egg problem, you know, who will commit first, right? To long, especially long distance distribution in large countries, whatever. Uh, bottom line, that would be the best thing. Uh, there are problems, but fundamentally, yes, 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 yes. However, get me from A to that yes, yes, yes point, right? right? Eventually, we may get there, but not anytime soon, because it's committing to the whole system, really, right? 
and there is no way how hydrogen could go organically, little bit by little bit, right? I mean, you know, I'm just start doing something in my basement, really, right? You know, I can put something on my roof, really, right? I can reduce my consumption by putting triple windows, but I cannot <laughs> move to hydrogen meaningfully as an individual, as a or as an American state or whatever. It requires the mega system and. Uh, very difficult now. Yeah. Your example, you can put a solar on your roof. Yeah, you can do lots of the things. Yeah. You can do lots of the things. Hydrogen, but incremental know. hydrogen. Tell me, please, how do you incremental hydrogen? Right? You know, not only as an individual, but as a state, as a as a company, really. Right? You know. Right? Yeah. Uh, let's go to the very back first. At the very back, I'll come back to you. Vasil, thanks a lot. Uh, so it, the humankind in its history saw wars for land, for gold, recently for oil. Do you think we will see sooner, sooner or later wars for pollutions? You mean see war? War, like physical. Ah, uh, yeah. People used to write these things. Uh, there was this guy, I forgot his name. He was writing these books about, you know, uh, oh, you must remember, 2005. You would be sitting in this room in 2005. What was the hot topic of 2005? Imminent and peak oil, right? Imminent and peak oil. The world is running out of oil and we will never see any oil, right? And I wrote a longish paper about it saying, these people are members of some weird cult, really, right? I mean, there is so much oil on this planet, you know. Hey, this is a gas planet, but next to it, it's a kind of your know, liquid fuel planet, right? And people say, what an idiot that smell is, really, right? He knows nothing. Within two years, we are back to Neanderthal times. We'll be killing each other with spears because there'll be no energy. We'll be run out of oil. You remember, you know, peak oil. Everybody will speak oil, right? I mean, you know. No, no, there is so much energy out there, you know, that uh, of any form. There is so much. There was this session this morning, you know, uh, massive natural gas in, in Eastern Mediterranean, right? You would tell Lebanese or Israelis 20 years ago, you'll be elect energy superpowers, right? They would get you say, ah, really, right? And they are really, right? There is so much undiscovered oil, so much undiscovered. It's only a matter of money. Eventually, we will run out of that because you don't want to drill like 15 kilometers and there is hardly any oil down there. It's too hot, really. But there is plenty of old stuff to be discovered, coal, oil, gas, plus there is endless amount of solar radiation and and uh, whatever. Uh, I just don't see any fights over that, you know. I, I don't see even any fights for food because think of it that right now what we grow, I mean, there is about 800 million people who don't have enough eat, but what we grow globally, do you people know how much we waste globally on the average? It's 40% now, 40 to 45%, right? So. All you have to do is to price it right, and people would save a little bit more, really. So I don't see wars about, about uh, energy. I don't even see wars about food, really, because we overproduce and waste absolutely everything, really, right? Uh, uh, wars about religion, oh, any time, any day. It's been going for thousands of years. People just will fight for whatever. But uh, resource-wise, I see. About water, if you would say water, uh, I say yeah, I may consider the point, absolutely, you know, because mm -hmm. water situation, which at one point somebody should raise at this meeting uh, something that which is absolutely unique, so I, I use this opportunity to mention it. Fracking does something which no other human activity ever done in human history. It removes water from the biosphere. All the time we use water, we just use it you know, we irrigate, evaporates, it stays in the biosphere, right? You drink it, you urinate, right? Stays in the biosphere. You frack, and it's so damn polluted that you cannot return it to the biosphere. You have to bury it deep underground, really, beyond any reach of anybody. So the only way that water could return to circulation would be in millions of years with geological upheavals, really, right? For the first time in human history, we are sucking water out of the biosphere and putting it beyond human reach. Now, the volumes are still smallish, Very right? Yeah. However, people think that this should be our mode of production for the next thousand years, right? Tax and fracking, I'm afraid not really, right? You know, so water, I would consider a, a serious problem, right? Next question there. Are you a skeptic about keeping to two degrees, and are you a skeptic about keeping to three degrees? You should be skeptic about skeptic? everything, as I said. The, the duty <laughs> of a scientist to be skeptic, right? Uh, but I think this debate of one and a half or two or, or three is immaterial because, you know, how can you, are we so smart that we will stop it at one and a half? Of course we cannot stop it. We cannot stop it. Any, besides, what is that stupid one and a half and two? That's the global average. There are no global averages of temperature, right? Already the warming in the Arctic, in Canadian Arctic and Alaska, right, is three and a half or four and a half, right? So 
This is meaningless, this is one and a half. This is just good. You know what? This comes out from because people like to model with computers, really, right? So this is a computer model, one and a half. It has no relation to reality, none whatsoever, because that temperature will be very uneven and distributed around the globe, really, right? So why do we, why we do one and a half? You see, and then it shows another propensity of humans. This Simple-mindedness is zero or five. One and 1.4, one and 1.6. Is there a scientific basis of 1.5 as opposed to 1.45, really, right? We just like to round to the nearest five or zero, really. That's how it is. So please, one and a half, two degrees, immaterial. I don't want to be engaged in the discussion. The question is, if you are serious about it, how should we bring it down as fast as possible, blah, 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 without any one and a half or two degree, really, right? You know? I, I'm going to take just one question this side because I do want to come this side as well. Okay. So so over there. Okay, so just quick one. Question. Uh, so what are your thoughts on role of AI to solve some of these issues? About what, sorry? AI. Artificial intelligence, role of artificial intelligence. I am the last guy, uh, who should, you know, there is this machine right here and it's pouring coffee for you, really, right? You know, so, okay, <laughs> that's all I will say about it, really, right? And the other thing I will say about AI is that I mentioned a horrible winter this year. If you have brought that autonomous vehicle to Winnipeg this January, right, when you couldn't see where the road ends and the sidewalk begins, there is no white line to be seen. In fact, there is basically white out around you and minus 45, really, right? Good luck with your AI autonomous car in Winnipeg in January. You know what? We are light years away from anything like that, but just people like to blabber about this, so we blabber. If I would have a penny for every mention of AI, I would be a zillionaire, as you know now, really, right? But where is the real AI, right? Uh, as people said, let's play this game. I'm looking for a robot, right? Well, you know, I traveled around half of the country. Did I see any robots on my way, really, right? You know, no? I mean, there are those, there are those things in practice, really, right? So, so much about AI. Hype, overhyped, 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 hype. That's what it is. But, but, Rock Lab, there is, there is uh, uh, robots in factories. Though. Of course, there are robots. And they've been robots in factories, they've been there for ages, really, right? First, you know, I mean, Jacquard, look, we had these things on punched cards. We had robots for a long time, you know, weaving the pattern. That's how we start. That's 18th century, right? You make a punched card and you play a melody or you weave a fabric pattern. There's nothing new about it. Now, instead of putting a punch card, you put it, you know, on a whatever, on a microchip and program it, right? There's nothing new. Similar. We are much less inventive than people think. I mean, new Invention. We were inventive in the very, you know, uh, in my talk uh, tomorrow, I think I'll talk about that, you know, how uninventive we have been in past 50 years, right? As opposed to people say, oh, this is unprecedented, everything. What is that thing which I, which I absolutely hate is uh, groundbreaking innovations, really, path-breaking innovations, right? We haven't had anything groundbreaking and path-breaking in the past 50 years, and I mean it seriously. And if you want to challenge me, come to my talk tomorrow, really, right? You know, we are just coasting on our past success, really. But in past 30, 40 years, uh, it's been very meager, really. If you think this is the great innovation, it ain't really, right? You know, it's a debilitation of human mind, right? So that's what it is, really, right? So. All right, uh, one more question on this side. Yeah, right there. What are you most excited about in the last year? <laughs> what are you most excited about? <sighs> yeah, I understood the question now. I mean, uh, this is <laughs> <laughs> why, I, why I'm hesitating is this, you know, that, uh, that uh, as somebody pointed out, you know, French people um, are always kind of dubious about Americans because Americans are always excited. Uh, to, be, to be excited in French means that you are sexually aroused, right? So, you know, uh, I, I don't know why Americans are always, I haven't been excited about anything in true French sense or even in American sense. Really. <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, just, uh, I mean, there is so much hype and any fool now stands up and makes a statement and you know, I feel in this correction mode. I used to be in the correction mode like, you know, half of the time. Now I'm in the correction mode 100% of the time because hardly there is anything, anybody makes any statement, which I see is false. It's just, you know, it's patently false. And people repeat it and retweet it and send it around, really, right? So, uh, I mean, we live in a real age of hype and, and, and fake news and fake claims. I call it, you know, the, the, what is, uh, I mean, I will see probably when I get home and switch on the, the Infernal TV, I'll see one next Monday. There is this press conference called, and there are these five people in white coats, right? And they say, we've discovered a new treatment for cancer, right? 
And then they will say, but in practice, it will not be available for the next 10 years. Then you will never hear about it, right? This, thing, this is what's happening in science and technology now, right? People make this huge announcement, we discover this thing, right? and you'll never hear about it in the future, right? You know, so uh, it's just, we used to have this, this fusion, right? Always hydrogen economy, right? Always inherently safe small reactors. Have you seen one? We've, we've been having them since 1982, really, right? But now it's just with everything is like that. Everything's like fusion or inherently safe small reactors or whatever. I mean. But what club the world is definitely getting better, don't you think? Uh, yes, it's getting better, but it's getting worse at the same time. It's a matter of, you know, this selective inattention to facts, really, right? Uh, if you want me to start on how it's getting worse, uh, <laughs> <laughs> deepest, do you know how deep is the deepest trench in the Pacific Ocean? 11 kilometers deep, right? 11 kilometers deep, right? There's a beautiful new paper, scientific, vetted properly. In the deepest trenches, in the deepest part of the Pacific Ocean, the deepest worms living on this enormous pressure, the Irish, they all of them contain plastic. All of them, all of them contain plastic. Now, we've polluted, the, this whole planet is basically a plastic planet now, right? We produce about 300 million tons of it every year, and of that, about 10% ends up in the ocean every year at a clip of 30 million. People don't even talk about it. If this is a world getting better, you know, basically every baby born now is sucking in mom's milk some plastic, really. I just don't know if it's a good news, really, right, you know. And plus, we don't recycle it. They have all these recycled bins here, right? This is all sham. This is for a show. Because China stopped taking your American junk. They don't recycle anymore. So this is just, they will just simply do with it. They'll take it from the recycle bin and they'll turn it into landfill. Okay, so much for recycling. It's just like a, the security theater at American airports, right? When they do this, uh, once a year they do this uh, checking how many weapons we can get through, really. And they discover on the last one that 90% of weapons got through. Regardless, anyway, right? Mm. So this is just the thing, like, oh, I saw the, here is paper, here is plastic, right? And they just simply tip it in somewhere into, or they export it to Mexico, maybe, right? Or whatever, right? So you remember, but, you know, I just wrap it up to say, uh, I think you said to me, you're not a pessimist, you're not No, optimist. I'm a realist, you're I'm a realist, realist, right? And things are always getting better, but us being human, things are always getting worse. We have to compensate, really. I mean, we could, otherwise we would be the angels. We would be Steven Pinkers, all of them, right? We have, we have to compensate. So we do good stuff, but uh, boy, we do lots of bad stuff all the time, really, right? So. Wachlaf Schmiel, scanner of wide horizons. Thank you.